Hello, greetings. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. And it feels like it's been a while since our last Native Prairie Speaker Series um, in early October, but we're excited to be back. Uh, today, Jordan Voss, a master's student at the University of Lethbridge, will be speaking about diet analysis of prairie amphibians. Before we begin, um, I'd like to just before we get going, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Um, I'd also like to note that PCAP's speaker series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with prairie conservation or species at risk. And I'd like to invite everyone to join us for a webinar about monarchs and native plants by Emily Putz from the Nat um, Nature Saskatchewan. And that's 12 p.m. in Saskatchewan or 11 a.m. if you are from Alberta. And then I also want to remind everyone to save the date. January 25th will be our first webinar for 2024 about burrowing owls in Alberta. And as always, you can register for these upcoming webinars on our website. Uh, we have over 100 people registered for today's webinar, so you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, but if you have any questions, just type into the questions section and we'll um, handle questions at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to take a moment to note financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, North American Helium, Nutrien, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and SASTAL. So without further ado, I'm pleased to talk a little bit about today's presenter. Uh, Jordan Voss has completed a Bachelor's of Ecosystem Management at Lethbridge College and is currently working on her Master's of Biological Science at the University of Lethbridge. Bridge. Her lifelong fascination with amphibians has led her to research focusing on diet analysis of prairie amphibians in southern Alberta. Jordan has worked as a park interpreter and nature program leader for five years, gaining a passion for the outdoors, hiking, identifying plant species and watching wildlife, and storytelling. And she remains a passionate steward of sustainable agriculture as a researcher and as a rancher's daughter. So take it away, Jordan. Awesome. Thank you very much for that warm welcome, Caitlin. I am super excited to be here today. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here real quick so I can show you my awesome slides that I've made for you today. And then we'll get started as soon as my slideshow starts presenting for us here. All right. So as Caitlin mentioned, uh, my topic is on diet analysis of prairie amphibians, particularly in southern Alberta, but many of the species overlap with Saskatchewan. So if you're interested in some of this work in Saskatchewan, uh, I'm sure that we could discuss opportunities kind of further on. So a bit of contents for plans today. So I'll talk a little bit about me, my background and my passion for amphibians. And then we'll talk about the topic background, some of the methodology that I will be using, the value of the research and some further work. And then we'll have some time for questions as well at the end. Uh, I also have the slides labeled with numbers at the bottom right. So if you have questions about a certain slide, you can always take notes and then bring them up in the side as well. But without further ado, uh, this, Almost all of these pictures are actually taken by myself. And this one is actually a tiger salamander that my family found. So I always love seeing anything to do with amphibians. So who am I? Uh, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Jordan. You can also call me Joe. I'm a professional frog nerd. I have loved amphibians from a very young age and have inspired my family to also get involved with anything amphibian wise. I have a Bachelor of Ecosystem Management from Lethbridge College, and as part of that, we did a senior project which focuses on uh, different, whatever research topics we essentially want to focus on, and I chose to look at grazing and amphibians, so my research kind of went that way. Again, my research during that year was in a drought year, so I didn't receive uh, too much data, but it is something that has been a consistent throughout my life. Amphibians have always been part of my life. Uh, some of these photos are actually from this field season, so I will take any opportunity possible to take people out with me and to do my research. Uh, in the bottom middle picture is my supervisor, Dan Johnson, who is part of my master's project and is helping me a lot through it. 
And then in the top middle is an image of a boreal chorus frog young of the year. So it is just metamorphized this year and it was one that I caught. And then we also have in the left, a Northern leopard frog tadpole that is found kind of around where my family lives in Maple Creek, Saskatchewan. And then on the right is my fiance and I, because he's one of the most common people that I drag out on my field work. And he's super, super supportive of my goals and my career. So these are some important aspects of my life. So a bit of background into the passion and why I love amphibians so much. I have loved them since a young age. I remember being like six years old and going uh, frog hunting and having pet salamanders and really being fascinated by their life cycle and their history. And I would catch flies and little insects and feed them to them and always wanted to know more. And so once I got into my undergrad and the different field opportunities that we had, I had the chance to encounter a lot more amphibians. And I have seen almost every amphibian in Alberta except for the long-toed salamander so far. And uh, just a couple of examples here. So uh, this left one that I came up first, this is a spotted frog kind of in the crow's nest past. On the right, is a, on the right bottom is a northern leopard frog from the Cypress Hills area. This top one that just came up is a spade is a plain spadefoot toad that's around uh, the prairies kind of by where I live in Maple Creek. Uh, this little one in the top right is a western toad young of the year and they are extremely tiny and adorable. I love them. And then these are some of my siblings and I when we went out and uh, helped NCC, the Nature, Cer Nature Conservancy Canada, uh, with some of their volunteer opportunities in doing some amphibian surveys. And I always love taking my siblings along whenever I can. My little brother actually helped me with some of my field data collection when I was doing my senior project. So it's really important to me to share that joy with the younger uh, generation and people coming into the field. And as working as an interpreter in Cypress Hills in Saskatchewan, I was very passionate about sharing my joy for the wetlands and creating programs that related to anything to do with amphibians or tying it in in any kind of fun way that I could. And just for fun, a frog appreciation slide here. Uh, my fiance and I went to the Netherlands. So these two left photos, the farthest left is a common toad that's from the Netherlands. This middle one is a common frog. And then on the right here, this is actually the day that my fiance proposed to me. And I can't tell you which one I was more excited for seeing the baby Western toads or the engagement, but I do love frogs and amphibians so much. So 100% highlight of the day. So a bit of background about the topic itself. So I am studying a master's of science uh, in biology at the University of Lethbridge. And originally my topic was going to be looking at uh, pesticides and their effect on amphibians. The original, original topic would have focused on pesticides and tadpoles and how they would take in pesticides aquatically. Then I modified it, wanted to do more so on the adult side. And then due to timing and constraints and a couple other things that didn't quite work out, uh, ultimately, I decided to go the diet route. Firstly, because there really isn't a lot of information provided for uh, diets of amphibians in Alberta. It's known that they are opportunistic carnivores, so they will eat almost anything that moves that comes in their view, but it's not necessarily known what parameters they have for choosing their prey, whether it's a certain size, whether it's timing, at what age do they actually switch over and change their diet, because when they're tadpoles, they'll actually eat algae, most of them. Spadefoots are an, an exception to the rule, and they actually can be a little bit cannibalistic when they have their siblings in small ponds. But generally, they uh, switch once they metamorphize and become adults. So there was a lot of questions that I had and very few answers. There is some work and some published works about amphibians in Alberta. Uh, but overall, in, in the entire world, amphibians are one of the species that, or groups, I should say, that are one of the least studied. And because of that, there's not a lot known in terms of how many species there are in conservation. Uh, there is also a higher risk of extinction simply because their life cycle goes through so many different stages and requires so many different habitats. And in the prairies, for example, 
our tadpoles will spend their time in wetlands and whether they're ephemeral wetlands, which means they're temporary, they come when it has heavy rains, or whether they need to be more established and deeper, they do require those wetlands for their tadpole stage. And then once they get into the adult stage, then they kind of migrate and roam out past that a little bit. And that's where connectivity comes into play when you have different, uh, different prairie ecosystems. And when you don't have that connectivity, you can have things like road mortalities, you will make it harder for them to even find another wetland. So oftentimes they come, res they become restricted to the wetland that they're currently living in. So you wanna consider a lot of these factors if you're ever into this kind of thing that there isn't a lot of knowledge already out there. Uh, the amphibians, because they're one of the most at-risk groups, it is becoming a little bit more common, but generally there's not a lot that's known about them, even on basic life history information and diet being one of them, there's not a lot of diet information. So these are all things that I really wanted to consider when I was developing my project. And I don't have any data yet, uh, simply because I've had difficulties with animal care and timing because the breeding season for most of the amphibians on the prairies kind of ranges from about late April to early July. And by the time I had all of my training and permits in place, it was about mid-July. So they were starting to hunker down for the summer. It's not that they're not out there at all. It's just that they won't be as easy to find. They're not necessarily calling because they're not breeding. Uh, usually they'll be in that in-between stage where you'll have the tadpoles becoming uh, froglets, becoming the uh, young adults. And when you have that kind of change between the different life cycles, it gets a little bit more tricky to actually find the critters that you're looking for. So I don't have uh, data yet on the diet analysis. It's kind of my goal for the next field season but we'll talk a bit about my project itself. So I have been uh, so far working with the Silver Sage Conservation Site from the Alberta Conservation Association. They are a fantastic partner. If anyone is interested in any of their conservation work that they do, uh, I can put you in contact with some of their people, but they are incredibly helpful. They know a lot and these sites are very well maintained. I'm hoping to add some other sites as well to kind of diversify my uh, range of data. But this uh, image here is actually taken from one of the wetlands that's on the Silver Sage site. And Silver Sage is very interesting because it has uh, areas where it is uh, native prairie and it has areas that have been reclaimed. And uh, my supervisor, Dan Johnson, is actually focusing on the grasshoppers and other insects within the area and noticing that there is a distinct difference between the areas of the modified reclaimed pasture compared to the native pasture and the different species that prefer it. And as such, those different insect species will play a role in the food web and how amphibians eat them. Uh, there are boreal chorus frogs in this wetland pictured. Uh, I know because I heard them when I went out for an initial survey and they were calling. I did also catch three young of the year for my training purposes when getting my animal care. And uh, other than that, I haven't caught much out of here yet, but fingers crossed, hopeful for next year. So for methods in catching amphibians and making sure that they are not harmed, the most common way to go about doing that is setting up pitfall traps and using drift fences to kind of direct them. So this top left image is showing how I had them set up. Uh, they are the really deep uh, ice cream buckets, and they're really useful because uh, the amphibians that are found in southern Alberta don't jump high enough to get out. And they're also not so large that it takes a lot of digging. And I really like having the lids so that when they're not active, when I'm not actively catching uh, amphibians, I can put the lid on, leave them for the most part. They don't get messed with too much uh, until, of course, <laughs> uh, the sites get used for grazing, which is part of the management practices. And as a rancher's daughter, 100% appreciate that. Uh, but cows and pitfall traps don't mix. <laughs> so uh, the image on the right shows how they can get a little bit trampled and damaged. And they are quite rugged, the buckets themselves. So usually you can just pop them up and fix them. Uh, but for the most part, this is the method that I use. I have had good luck with it so far, at least in catching the three that I needed this season. And uh, yeah, generally you set up a fence along the way so that it directs them towards the buckets, they fall in, 
and you check it regularly during the uh, during the the session that you're out there for so that they are not spending too much time in there. Uh, and generally it's done at night because most of our amphibians are more active in that dusk to nocturnal range, uh, especially depending on some species like the spadefoot toad, for example, they are extremely nocturnal. So you'd have to be out there pretty late to look for them. Uh, if you are interested in doing things like this, there are permits required. Uh, just something to keep in mind. I don't recommend doing this if you are just wanting to do it for your own research and knowledge, but it is uh, one of the methods that we use in research. And this little guy here that uh, is in the top left here, this is one of the boreal chorus frogs, young of the year that we caught while we were out there during one of these nights. I was actually conveniently out there with my fiance and I had zero hopes of catching anything. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go check the traps. I'll see if there's anything in there. There probably isn't. He was up on the top of the hill so that we could kind of look out over the whole area. And then I went down to go and check it and uh, he could he could hear me pretty excited <laughs> that we caught a little frog. So it was a good night. So in terms of methods and dietary analysis, so there's a couple of different ways to go about it. And the three main ways that are established in research. So there's stomach dissection where you have to kill the individual and dissect the stomach contents in order to figure out what they're eating. And it's not really feasible, especially when you're working with a lot of these species that are at risk or are susceptible in their populations. It's not something that you really want to encourage. If you're killing the species that you're trying to study and keep their numbers up, it kind of goes against what you're working with. Uh, it also isn't necessarily as effective as the other two in the sense that there's a possibility of the items in the stomach digesting. And when you have items digested, it is harder to identify them. So uh, stomach dissection is useful in species that are invasive. So for example, this has been used with bullfrogs in BC where they are invasive. And uh, it has been extremely useful in identifying what kind of species they're eating. In fact, some of the bullfrogs out there have been identified as eating baby turtles, mice, other frogs. They're very carnivoristic and anything that will fit in their mouth, they're very <laughs> ready to eat. Uh, generally, our frogs around here aren't going to do that kind of thing, mostly because they're too small. Uh, you will find that the northern leopard frogs, if given the chance, will eat other frogs and will eat uh, other larger objects, just depending on how big they are when they are eating. The other method is the fecal and DNA analysis. So this requires housing the amphibian overnight or at least over a period of time until they expel their fecal matter and then re-releasing them. So you're hoping that they've eaten something, you're hoping to get something out of it, and then you have to perform DNA analysis on the fecal matter to identify what insect species or prey species are being found in that fecal matter. Uh, this has a couple of limitations, again, because you can't necessarily identify the whole body organism. You might not necessarily know where to start in terms of identification. So if it has snails, for example, and you're just doing DNA analysis for uh, grasshoppers and other insects, you might not pick up those same DNA patterns, and therefore you'd miss a whole part of your data set. So stomach flushing is the method that I am planning to use. It is cost effective, it is quick, and it is uh, the least harmful to the amphibians themselves. And uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures here from our training. So this is a boreal chorus frog young of the year. This is the one that we caught in the pitfall traps for the training purposes. And essentially you have a syringe and a tube attached to a syringe and the syringe is full of water. Uh, it either has to be water that is filtered from the source that they are found in because they're extremely uh, sensitive never tap water and uh, either that or spring water uh, that is bottled and then I usually let them kind of sit in it for a little bit to acclimate and for this case especially this was when I brought them back to Lethbridge to the lab for this purpose. In the field it would 100% be the water from the wetland that they're sitting in. It reduces a lot of uh, issues with them uh, responding negatively to it and it's easier. There's water right there if you filter it you can just use it. But essentially, it's a tube attached to a syringe, and then you have to insert the tube into their mouth and into their stomach a little bit. And the tube has to be small enough to fit in the mouth and 
uh, allow room for the food to come up and yet big enough to allow the water to go through at a decent rate to actually flush the food items out. So this is probably the smallest amphibian that I will be working with in my studies. And uh, you can see just how tiny that tube is. Uh, the first image of the stomach flushing, I was having help with squeezing the syringe. And then the second one here is where I'm squeezing the syringe in one hand and holding the, uh, the little frog in the other. And this was kind of the goal of the training so that when I'm out in the field, I can do it by myself and I don't necessarily need the assistance and uh, extra time commitment from having another person with me or if I don't have someone with me on the nights that I'm uh, going out frog hunting. So it is uh, helpful, it is useful. And then this image is the uh, contents from the stomach. And these are about three fruit flies. I fed them to the boreal chorus frogs before we did the process, just so we could see how effective it was. And as you can see, well, I guess you can't really see, uh, but there are distinguishably three flies in this stomach contents. And what that means is that when I want to go and analyze the diets of the amphibians in the field, if I catch them at the right time, and if they haven't digested all their food, there's a good chance that I'll be able to identify most of their stomach contents just based off of uh, visual identification. And then if I need to use DNA analysis to confirm or uh, give a little bit more uh, robustness to my data, then I can. But it just allows it so that there's more of a starting ground to work off of. And it's faster because as soon as they are done having their stomach flushed, I usually let them sit for about five minutes and then they'll go back off scamper off into the prairies again, little buddy. And uh, they respond really, really well to it. It doesn't require any uh, anesthetic or they don't need to be put under or anything like that because it's relatively painless. So, yeah. So this research does have a couple of different values. Of course, in terms of identifying the diet items, uh, this leads to implications in food chain protection. So like I mentioned, how there are different grasshoppers for different areas of silver sage, those different insect species will have different emergence times and will be different sizes throughout the season. And depending on what kind of amphibian you are, if you're a big northern leopard frog, you're not going to be as picky necessarily in the size of your food, or at least it is assumed, it is not known. Uh, and then generally, if you're a smaller boreal chorus frog, your food items are going to be a lot more limited. So understanding how your food web interacts and the plant species that those insects depend on, that your amphibians depend on the insects for food, all of these things lead into different factors that need to be considered. The other value is the nutritional value, understanding if these amphibians are actually getting enough nutritional value and how that plays into things like how they overwinter. Are there populations possibly being affected by diet availability? Are they getting enough food? or if they are getting enough food, what other factors are affecting them. Of course, there is the intrinsic value. If you understand what things eat, it helps with the conservation. If you have salvage opportunities, then knowing what to feed them will generally help, uh, as well as the conservation and productivity of rangelands. I mentioned that my senior project focused on grazing and amphibians. And generally your wetlands that have amphibians in them are a lot healthier and your productivity of your grazing lands will actually be a lot better. And so there is the value in that. If you conserve your land specifically focusing on amphibians, most other things will follow and you'll have a really productive area that is valuable for years to come. Uh, as well as recognizing the factors that lead to the presence or absence of amphibians on an area. So whether if diet isn't a factor, if everything is all great and wonderful, uh, what is affecting these amphibians? Or if diet is affecting them, is it because they aren't getting enough? Is it because their diet items are being affected by pollutants like pesticides or other chemicals and they're taking that in through their diet? Or other factors that <laughs> really could be identified through a lot of different ways. Diet is one of the greatest things when you're looking at wildlife studies in understanding how they respond to their area. And it's one of the main needs for living things in that you need water, food, shelter, and uh, exchange of gases in some form. 
So food being one of those extremely important things, if we don't understand how food is playing into amphibians and their response to their world around them, it's very difficult to perform other studies and to understand the different factors that are going into those. So it's a really base level important bit of information. So my master's topic itself, uh, because I don't have much data and results from this season, in the next season, I will be focusing more on being out there and getting that data. I am also working with GIS, which is Ge Geographic Information Systems, and using that analysis to figure out which diet items and habitat ranges uh, are uh, possibly overlapping for different amphibian species, and then figuring out uh, if different prey items might be selected by different species, depending on their habitat needs uh, and their prey's habitat needs and other factors as well, like body physiology, how the different body types influence what prey they eat and how their hunting patterns affect what they eat. For example, most saddlemanders uh, are extremely predatory and they will actively hunt for their prey. Uh, whereas most frogs and toads are ambush predators where they will sit and wait for things to kind of move across their path and then get them that way. So understanding how that is affecting what prey they eat, whether they're specifically seeking a certain type or whether they just take what they get. The other thing too is timing of prey item emergence. So different uh, grasshoppers will emerge at different times and they will be different sizes throughout the year. And again, with size of prey and the size of amphibian, if your prey is larger than you, you're probably not going to eat it, uh, as well as the prey capture methods. Uh, like I mentioned, the hunting versus the active, or sorry, the active hunting versus the sit and wait strategies. And then there's other things too, like climate change and the occurrence of drought. So in my senior project, I encountered this because we were in a major drought year in 2021. And it was very difficult to find the amphibians that I wanted to research. And so I had to consider different ways of going about it. But that also shows another factor that plays into amphibian conservation and how climate change will affect these populations into the future. Not to mention, if climate change affects the prey species that they're eating, even if everything else is going well, if the timings are different on the insect species and the prey species that they're looking for, how is that going to affect their populations? Uh, the other things that I'm interested in, if I take this work further, is figuring out the diet of different life stages. So comparing how the nutrition value of algae for tadpoles is comparative to the insects or prey for the adult frogs, uh, toads, or salamanders. And then the other thing too, I would love to tie it back into my original goal of figuring out pesticides or other pollutant uptake through the diet, because oftentimes excuse me, oftentimes the pesticides that focus on insects might not necessarily kill them right away. So if amphibians are still eating these insects, how much pesticides are they going to be taking into their body through their diet? And how is that going to affect their own body and their own uh, populations as well? And plus, this will also feed into a food, uh, food web-based uh, approach to conservation. So oftentimes, Amphibians are very intersectional in the sense that if you're trying to protect them, like I mentioned, if you're trying to protect for amphibians, your productivity of your land will be a lot better simply because it ties into how their habitat interacts with everything else. When you have good wetlands with healthy green zones and high water quality, you're going to see a lot better situations than if you have areas that don't have strong bank support or have a lot of turbidity through the particles and the uh, dirt items through the water and things like that. So understanding the food web-based approach to conservation not only benefits the amphibians, but it benefits every other organism that's within that system. So these are a handful of my resources. If you're ever interested, uh, I can provide this list to you. But for the most part, that covers everything that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I am going to open it up to questions. Uh, if you have any from specific slides, you can let us know. But super excited to hear from you.
First of all, thank you so much for the awesome presentation. It was very informative. Um, I learned a lot. <laughs> Glad and to your, hear it. Your, your passion and excitement for amphibians is clearly contagious. Um, we'll give everyone a minute to type in their questions. So just in the Q&A section, um, you can type it in there. And I think I've set it up properly that you can upvote other people's questions if you think um, if you think it's a good one too, or if you have a similar question. Um, so yeah, feel free to type those in. Um, and then just while we give everyone a minute there, Jordan, um, I guess what's the most interesting that you've, amphibian that you found so far? Ooh. See, I, my very personal favorite, and this is extremely biased, is the plain spade foot toad. I think they're such a fascinating organism. Mm. They are extremely drought tolerant and they will hunker down like three meters below the surface for however long they need to until a large enough rain event comes and triggers their breeding process. So I mentioned that the breeding process for most amphibians kind of ranges from April to July-ish, but plain spadefoot can go at any point in time through the season, as long as there's enough rain to trigger their breeding cycles. And when they have really big years, they will have ephemeral pools like the temporary wetlands that are formed in the puddles and they will be overrun with spade foot tadpoles and it is a fascinating thing to see they also can be cannibalistic because when you're in that small of a water system there's generally not enough food to go around so once in a while you'll find one tadpole that's slightly larger than the rest and it's like ah <laughs> you were very hungry <laughs> and i think there's a few less of you so it's just a fascinating way that they they compensate for all of the different factors that lead to their lifestyle. And I just think they're really neat. They also have really cool vertical eye slits because they're nocturnal. They have eyes like a cat, whereas most other toads that are in the area will have horizontal eye slits. So mm. similar to how our pupils will widen and close with the light. But I just absolutely very love them. They're so cute. Yeah, very <laughs> interesting. Uh, so we've had a few questions come in. The first one is from May. Um, and she says, you appear to handle amphibians a lot. How do you make sure that they don't get a disease or poisoning from, um, from you handling them? That's a really good question. And if you have kids or are, are, are interested in handling of amphibians, uh, the first and foremost thing is if you are planning to go frog hunting, do not use sunscreen, do not use bug spray on your hands. Do not use lotions. Anything that we put on our skin is made for our skin. Because amphibians breathe essentially through their skin and they take up that moisture through their skin, uh, we don't want to harm them. So by making sure your hands are clean of anything, usually I wash with soap before I go out to the field. And then I generally rinse my hands in the water body itself. Uh, of course, it is rinsed off like the soap's not on my hands, but it's just to acclimate with the water that they are currently in before I handle them at all. And then always keeping your hands moist while you're holding them. It does make them slippery slippery and harder to hold. But if you do that, you're more likely to protect their skin, especially because it is extremely delicate. You want to make sure that you're holding them properly and you have a firm grip on them, not too firm. Uh, and just generally keeping that in mind as you're going. But that's my, my best pro tips of like, don't use things on your hands that are chemicals that we use. Rinse them in the water. Hold them firmly with the water in your hand so it protects their skin. Great question. Yeah, it is. And um, I almost feel like we need to have more information out there. And maybe organizations don't want to encourage people for handling it. But if if a young kid is going to pick up a frog, you know, he's covered in sunscreen and bug spray to really think twice about it. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's one of the things, too, like working as an interpreter in Cypress Hills, we had a very uh, high population of northern leopard frogs in the lake there. Uh, we highly encourage people not to handle them. And usually when I'm running programs in any of those forms, I am like, we don't handle the frogs that are here. This is their home. If you want to do so, if you mm -hmm. have frogs at home, uh, these are some things that you can do to prevent them getting harmed and so that you have the best time yourself. All of our amphibians aren't poisonous to us, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's a common myth that you can get warts from toads. You cannot. <laughs> it's it's not at all possible. They do have poison glands on them, but it's more so so that if they're being eaten by a predator, they don't taste good. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah. So a listener named Paul says, are you looking at food availability versus food eaten? Uh, I will be once I actually get some actual data. Uh, I will 
and that's one of the upsides to working with Dan Johnson at the university because his specialty is insects. He is extremely helpful with figuring out the diversity and prey availability side of things. And then I come in with the amphibian side where I do the stomach flushing, we see what they are eating, and then we kind of compare the two. Great question. Yes. Um, do you think you'll focus more on the food availability side or what that, like what they've eaten already? More so on what they've eaten just for my purposes, simply because there is so little known about amphibian diet. There are some insect surveys and some predictions like general, like if you're in farming, you've probably seen grasshopper predictions for the year. Uh, some of them are harmful. Some of them are not. Dan, if you're looking for information on grasshoppers, Dan is a great one to go to. Uh, but my focus being amphibian, I really want to know what they're eating. I want to know if the size of them plays a factor into the prey that they're selecting and how they recognize that that is a prey item. That makes sense. Thanks for clarifying. No um, and a listener named Claudia says, do you know specific habitat requirements for leopard frogs and how might the proposed irrigation project near uh, Prince's Spring, near Bind Loss, will affect the leopard frog population there? Ooh, I don't actually know a lot about the irrigation uh, project itself. I can, however, speak to the habitat requirements. Northern leopard frogs require deep enough pools where they can overwinter. And generally where they don't have too many fish they can live with fish because they are you know fast enough to escape but if there isn't fish they'll have a better chance it's just that the water is deep enough that they're over winter they need to have sufficient vegetation cover um they do pretty well in flowing water bodies so i have seen them in cut off cut off areas of streams they won't do so well it will necessarily in the irrigation canals at least as far as i have seen so far if anyone else has personal experiences with that, I'm totally interested in that. I haven't experienced enough with the irrigation canals and amphibians on my own, but that is something very interesting. Uh, I yeah. might have to consider. Um, and a listener named Vic says, since the vegetation area affects the types of insects, will you include the impact of invasive plant species on prey availability? Since you mentioned that you wanted to diversify the scope of your research. Absolutely. Um, so for the masters, it will probably be fairly narrow. If I did take this into like a doctorate situation, I would do a very, very in-depth thing like this. Mm -hmm. It is on my list of things that I'm very fascinated by, um, especially with silver sage, for example, the modified reclaimed grassland is primarily crested wheat, which is an introduced species. And because of that, the insect species types are extremely different. So I am very interested in how those invasive species play a part in it. Especially, too, because a lot of the invasive species that you'll find around wetlands also don't have the same kind of root structure that our native species do, which can lead to that bank erosion and degra degradation. And so if you're noticing that those invasive species that are there in high numbers, like a one-off or two-off chance usually don't affect too, too much. But if you have them in high numbers where your bank is visibly eroding, you're generally going to notice more of an effect with the amphibians than if there's a couple and if you have great bank stability. But yeah, I'm very, very interested in how the invasive species and insects will play a part in it. Absolutely. And Jessica says, how will you capture the cyclical nature of insects? Meaning not every year is a high grasshopper year and other insects have the cyclical nature. Um, is there a way you can capture that in your research? Absolutely. So one of the goals, again, if I take this into a further multi-year project, I would consider things like the cycles and how those play a part in it, especially with GIS analysis. There's ways that we can make models with it and do kind of a predictive analysis in if these species are there, what are their usual emergence times? At what what kind of date range are these, this size and this age range? And then when do they kind of change for their instars and when do they change for their adult stages? So I am fascinated by that. I don't know enough of it right now, but it is something that I am considering in my factors in my research. 
That makes sense. And Shirley is wondering, um, the process of stomach flushing seems like very delicate work. How do you determine the correct size of the tube compared to the diameter of the esophagus? And um, she comments that uh, she understands that intubating a human can be very difficult, you know, the esophagus and trachea. I'm not mixing those up. Um, and how do you ensure that the amount of water flushed into the stomach is not too too much for the capacity of the stomach? That's a very good question. So it is extremely finicky. Uh, but at the same point, so when I was looking up the process and the different methods I could go about for diet analysis. So like I mentioned, there is the stomach dissection, the fecal analysis, and there's stomach flushing. Uh, I was particularly fascinated by the stomach flushing simply because there is one main document that has been published on the whole entire process itself. There's a couple other of publishings that have used the method and adapted it a couple of different ways, uh, but it doesn't really specify how, how big your tube should be and how much water you should use. It's kind of like, for a big amphibian, use a larger tube. For a smaller amphibian, use a smaller tube. So uh, that's also one of the things I will be de detailing once I actually get into publishing with the methodology is uh, going by tube sizes for the different species, at least that we have here in Alberta that I encounter. But generally, like I mentioned, you want the tube to be small enough to fit into their mouth that it allows the food to come back up past the tube. And you want it to be large enough that the water isn't going to get clogged or stopped. And then the other thing to consider as well is how fast you're bringing that water in. Like I'm not just taking the syringe and going and like, slamming it in there it's kind of a steady slow pace that it's fast enough that it flushes things but slow enough that it doesn't harm their poor little bodies uh as well their their stomachs are different than ours so we do have like the trachea and the esophagus they are kind of similar but they're they're eating large objects for their body size so generally the main goal for the items going in their mouth is stomach <laughs> And, and that's the best way I can explain it. And so like when a, when a frog swallows, for example, you'll notice they blink their eyes and that's how they swallow. So mm. when they do that, they're essentially shoving it down into their stomach. So when we flush it, it doesn't have a lot of resistance to come back up. It's not like ours where it's like got a lot of other pieces to come through before it comes back up. It's almost essentially like a purse. So if yeah. you, if you go in and you flush it out, it'll just come come right out <laughs> okay very different anatomy than humans <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> awesome well thanks for that detailed answer yeah. um since, <laughs> since we're all this time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, since we're on the topic, um, Shane is wondering, have you come across anything in their stomachs that surprised you or seemed unusual? Not yet. So like yeah. I mentioned, I only have the three young of the year boreal chorus frogs that I've caught. Yeah. Because I brought them to Lethbridge for the training, because technically I wasn't <sighs> allowed to do any of the stomach flushing in field until I had my training. They had their food items already digested. And then because of that, then I fed them the free fruit flies so that they could have something in their stomach. And because they are opportunistic, generally they're not very fussy. So they ate those three fruit flies. And then when I performed the stomach flushing, all three fruit flies came out. So that was also kind of a metric of like, is this actually going to be effective? Am I just going to get some of the stomach content or am I actually going to get all of it? And it was really, really effective. So I'm hoping that when I actually get into the field and with the timing of everything that it will be able to identify specifically, which is out there. I will say I have seen Northern leopard frogs eat snails and it is hilarious to me because they will like sit there, not move. They'll notice this thing moving extremely slowly out of the corner of their eye, reposition their whole entire body and then like wait for it and it's like the most slow motion thing ever it's so funny because it'll just like do 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 and then just boom, eaten <laughs> gone <laughs> so i personally could sit for hours and watch amphibians eat i just <laughs> <laughs> you should almost have like a facebook or instagram just on like amphibians eating and just like little <laughs> videos of their <laughs> i probably could i think i have a couple of them hanging around here <laughs> yeah. It'd be really neat. It'd probably be like a Facebook meme that'd go viral, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, 
So the next question is from Winston. Um, Winston says, so your research data is limited due to drought and availability of amphibians in the environment. Could the lack of amphibians be exasperated because droughts increase the concentration of pesticides and herbicides in an ecosystem and lower the ca carrying capacity even further than an ecosystem devoid of pesticides but still in drought? And making research during a drought especially difficult or perhaps skewing the results of your data to show diets um, that are more pesticide tolerant prey? That is a really good question. Oh, I love that so much. Okay, so originally because my topic was going to go this way with pesticides and looking at diet and seeing how the pesticides affect the insects, affect the diet of the amphibians, I was going to go that route. Now, because I am working with ACA, they don't apply pesticides in their areas. It's generally not something I have to worry about too, too much, um, depending on the wetland situation, how close it is to other farmland, what other pesticides they are using, because insecticides versus herbicides versus fungicides are all going to be different in how they affect uh, amphibians. There are a couple of studies on it, but not as many as I would like, obviously. Uh, so generally... The long, longest, shortish answer, <laughs> yes, it will affect the prey availability, simply because if you are killing off insects, you're going to be killing off prey availability in general, because they're generally considered opportunistic carnivores, and whatever they see, they're going to eat. However, mm -hmm. in the situations where they're living, and because especially when you get into really sensitive species like the... Uh, like the spadefoot toad or the great plains toad or le leopard frogs which all are really susceptible to human development they're not as common in those systems already and it's not known whether it is because of the prey availability whether it's because of the pesticides or whether it's just because those wetlands are broken off from everything else and there's no connectivity to get to and from them and those wetlands might have been worked over or uh, cultivated in the meantime. So there's a ton of different factors into why amphibians may or may not be there. Diet is a very small aspect of it, but pesticides with the diet is something that I'm very, very interested in and hoping to learn more about. So I don't have a very firm <laughs> definitive answer because there aren't definitive answers yet, but mm -hmm. I am interested in the pesticides side of things. Uh, again, because of drought, drought not only affects, uh, like Winston mentioned, it not only affects the concentrations of the pesticides and how that affects the uh, insects themselves, but drought also affects how much water availability is there. And because certain amphibian uh, species are drought tolerant, sometimes they might not even have difficulties with encountering that at all. Uh, and they might not necessarily realize to the same extent how pesticides play out. The other interesting thing too, from when I was doing the initial literature review of the pesticide side of things is that like, for example, leopard frogs, you might consider them if they're in a water system all the time and they take in that, uh, like they have their gas exchange through their skin exclusively, that they might come into contact with pesticides and take up more pesticides than say a toad would. But mm -hmm. the opposite is actually true. Because when you have northern leopard frogs, for example, present in a wetland all the time, they have mucous membranes, they have protections in place as kind of a barrier to keep those different chemicals from getting in as in high concentrations, like there are still some that will get in, but comparatively to a toad, because a toad is specifically looking for situations where it needs to take up as much water in a very short time because they might not encounter it as often they will be taking up water at a faster rate. They may not have the same kind of uh, mucus protections in place to prevent that from happening. So you actually might see higher concentrations of pesticides through their dermal impact uh, in a toad than you would at the same level in a frog. Hmm. So. Yeah, very interesting. Right there, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Great answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul's just saying a comment that it would be interesting to know how PFAS are affecting them. And, um, you know, I, I just did a quick Google search <laughs> <laughs> for other people that don't know. Um, uh, polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, so they're kind of those forever chemicals that we hear mm. about in the news. Um, do you have any comments about that? I unfortunately don't. It okay. would be interesting. 
there's a lot of things that would be interesting with amphibians. Like I mentioned, there's so little known about them. So if if you know someone who's into amphibians, let's let's build this field up a little bit more because I would love to see more herpetologists out there studying these things. It's it's so fascinating and I really would love to know more. <laughs> Absolutely. There's so much to learn. Yeah. <laughs> um, the next question is from Michael. How long can insects stay in an amphibian stomach before they break down and they're not recognizable? So it is pretty fast. Uh, it does vary from species to species and the prey size and a couple other different factors. Uh, generally, it's gone within a day. So anytime you do stomach flushing, you're only getting information from that night. Mm. Excuse me. So when I go out and do my studies, my plan is to be out there consecutively so that I get enough data over an area. And then that way I have enough substantial information about a species from an area over time versus just a snapshot of what this frog specifically ate this one night. <laughs> that makes sense. Absolutely. And we'll have to have you back when you've got that result. <laughs> I'm excited for it. <laughs> It's going to be awesome. so nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a couple questions about habitat. Mm -hmm. um, Glenn is wondering if you'll eventually compare amphibian habitat um, that's not strictly grassland um, because where he lives is Aspen Parkland. Um, and we know that you're from the Cypress Hills area. So yeah. <laughs> any thoughts about that? If I have time and if I have money and I, if I can be there, I will absolutely be anywhere getting my feet wet and learning as much as I can. Awesome. Um, so while I might not specifically be, I'm really hoping to inspire a lot of other people to get on this idea so that we can actually build more information about diet of amphibians, uh, simply because it's such a building block for so many other studies. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping to explore a little bit more. <laughs> Right on. All you need is time and money. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Two ingredients to life. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, no, absolutely interested in the in the areas, different areas and seeing the different species. I still have a bucket list of frogs and amphibians that I want to see. So Oh, right on. <laughs> very very fascinated. Yeah. Uh, James says, how would a man-made wetland versus a natural wetland compare for food availability for amphibian species? Any thoughts? Yeah, great question. So notice this a little bit with my senior project in grazing. So I also partnered with ACA for that project as well. Uh, and I used their Chinook and Bull Trail sites. And in that study, I was comparing a grazing versus a non-grazing area. Um, and I think the one area that was non-grazing had a history of being non-grazing for at least 10-ish years. Uh, it was around a, kind of a creek system. And then the Bull Trail area, they actually had some man-made wetlands. And uh, there are frogs calling in them. And because that was the drought year, I didn't happen to gather enough information on all the species that were out there. Because, I, again, I had other personal things going on in my life that I didn't get out to that area as soon as I would have liked to hear them calling. But I have heard from other people that they have situations where they are calling in those sites. So if if the essentially if you build it, they will come. The, it can be recovered. Uh, it's just coming down to whether or not there's that bank stability, the vegetation, and if there is enough of a population of prey items available for them to eat. So generally, they're pretty good. Frogs and amphibians are surprisingly resilient. I know most people think of them as a susceptible indicator species, but they are extremely resilient and they kind of have to be because they cover a very wide range of habitats. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> um, Paul is wondering if you'll be marking individuals in some way during your research. Um, yes. So we actually struggled with this for the animal care for the longest time because it's like, I want to mark them temporarily so I'm not catching the same animal and flushing it twice. Uh, and I also don't want it where I'm marking them permanently for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. So we're actually using a form of lipstick to <laughs> mark these frogs. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it's been said in other studies to be very useful. Uh, and as long as it's a certain brand, apparently they can still carry out their dermal processes through it. So oh, that's, that's the method that we're using. <laughs> I, I wonder who came up with that. Like if it was inspired by, you know, the 
tales of a princess kissing a frog or <laughs> <laughs> not too sure i i do know that like there's there's so many different ways to mark wildlife from like chips and tags and uh, <laughs> exactly there's so many different things you could do i'm sure yeah. anyone in a ranching industry has used the markers at branding season uh so you can use those in wildlife as well but for frogs they're a lot harder to find things that are temporary <laughs> so yeah yeah lipstick's the way we're going <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard of some other methods but lipstick sounds way way more appealing <laughs> right on well good for you for finding a way <laughs> thank you um, and then uh, another listener is wondering if your study will include salamanders as well and um, what we know about their diets and how it differs from frogs and toads. Yeah. So if I catch any amphibians, I'm going to be doing some stomach flushing <laughs> on them. <laughs> awesome. I mean, a little unfortunate there for them, but I mean, it'll help them in the long run. Um, yeah. From my experience with salamanders, raising them as a kid, uh, they will most amphibians will eat anything but uh salamanders are of course more known for being active hunters they also don't call so most of our other amphibian species that we have around the prairies are actively calling during breeding season whereas salamanders don't so there is a little bit less known about them and their life history other than the like general basics of they go from larva to kind of an in-between then become an adult and that sort of thing in between but I'm really hoping to catch some salamanders because I would love to have some identification. The stomach flushing is essentially the same. Uh, it is a little bit different just because they are that longer body type and the holding yeah. of them is slightly different, but for the most part, very similar body physiology and attacks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Cassidy's kind of wondering, oh yeah. Good, <laughs> um, <good. Cassidy's, laughs> um, Cassidy is wondering if you can differentiate between the calls of different frog and toad species. And yeah. I've I've personally heard about you know the comb sounds like I think the core if you're running your fingers along a comb it sounds like a chorus frog or um w wet fingers on a squeaky balloon yeah fingers on a squeak a wet balloon yeah 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 <laughs> for so a northern can, leopard frog and <laughs> absolutely you can totally identify amphibians by their sound a lot of pe a lot of birders do this to identify bird oh, species. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it is something that is done for amphibians. Personally, it's a lot easier because there's only like 10 yeah, it's <laughs> Canada that we really encounter. Um, but yeah, I can identify all of the uh, Alberta ones and you can too. There are a lot of sound clips. I honestly have a whole playlist on Spotify of frog calls. And uh, you can also find them. I believe the ACA website has uh, information about the Alberta specific amphibians that they have which of course overlaps with Saskatchewan. I think Saskatchewan mm -hmm. only has the gray tree frog as a bonus one because okay. uh, it came up from the States and from Ontario area. Um, but there are different calls. So like boreal chorus frog is one of the most common ones that most people will probably easily recognize, especially in the Southern half of the province and a little bit into the Northern half. Um, and it is like that poem where it's like that. Breep, breep, breep. Uh, and then you'll have your northern leopard frogs which is a little bit more of a lower pitch and it's like a and <laughs> i love your impressions <laughs> yeah. and then and then my favorite of course being the spade foot toad they kind of sound like a duck and they're like and it's just <laughs> so cool if you want to learn more there there are a lot of resources for identifying uh, amphibians by sound so if you want to learn them you're more than welcome to always love some by ear amphibian identification and awesome. it is really helpful too. You can actually use that for surveys and uh, understanding population sizes. There's actually a scale. So if you hear like one or two versus a full chorus, that'll depend on your area. And yeah, if you're wanting to learn more about that, like for sure contact me because there's a lot of different resources I can point you to. Right on. That's great. And I think your contact information is still up there. So if people yeah. are looking for more detailed information. Um, so I know we're kind of running out of time here, but there is um, one comment that I wanted to notice because it got upvoted a few times. Um, so from Hillary, uh, just a fun comment. Um, Hillary says, I was in my potato patch a few years ago picking off potato bugs. I noticed three leopard frogs sitting in the shade. So I started tossing the bugs, both the adults and larvae toward the frogs, which jumped towards the bugs as soon as they hit the ground. And she says, as I moved along the row of potatoes, the frogs moved with me. They were much fatter when I left the patch than when I started. Um, <laughs> do you have any comments about that? Sounds like she made some friends and they absolutely loved her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and 
I was a kid, I would do the, I would do a similar thing. Like I would have pet boreal chorus frogs and uh, tiger salamanders. Technically in Alberta, you're allowed to because they are non-licensed individuals. Um, if you're wanting to, you're, you're not allowed to keep anything that's at risk or protected or endangered. So mm -hmm. northern leopard frogs kind of off limits. Although I'm sure there's many a naturalist who has had experience with it. <laughs> holding on to some of them so I'm not gonna tell anyone uh just like just as a note it's it's kind of a thing but when I did have a, any kind of amphibian as a kid like my mom would catch me like going around the house with like a little shot glass and a paper and catching flies and shaking them up to give them a concussion and disorient them a little and throwing them in at them and then just sitting there for hours watching them eat <laughs> so yeah no it's really really cool and uh I did also learn that way too, that salamanders don't like maple bugs. <laughs> I think they actually have a chemical oh. that makes them not tasty. So yeah, they don't like them. <laughs> Interesting. So you come by this research, honestly, sounds like it's Absolutely. been a lifetime of <laughs> childhood fascination leading up to <laughs> your research. Honestly, my it, it's so fascinating to me how life takes you in such interesting pathways. I never expected to be doing this kind of work, and I love it so, so much. I really do. <laughs> well, your enthusiasm is contagious, and um, I just want to reiterate some of the comments that have been coming in. Excellent presentation and information. Thank you. Um, and yeah, there's been lots of comments that have been saying how, how much they enjoyed the conversation. So um, yeah, <laughs> awesome. this has been really great. So thank you so much, Jordan. No problem. Thank you all as well. And again, my contact info is there. If you want to reach out and send me an email or any information, feel free to. I would love to talk with fellow naturalist enthusiasts for amphibians. Right on. Well, with that, um, I'll just let everyone know that to sign up for our upcoming webinars on the PCAP website. We have been recording this webinar, so if you didn't catch it all, or if you know someone who would have loved it as much as you did, um, then you can catch it on our YouTube channel in the near future. And um, when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling that out, it helps us keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. Um, and I should also mention that, um, Jordan, you'd mentioned uh, Dan Johnson. Uh, mm -hmm. He did a webinar for us a few years ago about climate change and insects. And that's on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can just search whatever topic. We also have other ones about salamanders or um, leopard frogs. And yeah, it's a great resource. We have like 200 webinars there now. Um, but I'm sure with a little bit of just using that little magnifying glass to search, you'll be able to find Dan Johnson. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that too, I'll put a pitch in for that. So yeah, with that, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye.